Hello and welcome to the Dragon Con, Dragon Con uh, Electronic Forum on Internet Marketing for Authors and Creatives. We're going to talk about websites, newsletters, social media, all kinds of good stuff. But first, let's start with introducing our panelists. Jim, go ahead. Uh, I'm Jim Nettles. I write science fiction, urban fantasy, a bit of horror on the, the fiction side of the house. Uh, I always also write nonfiction. I do legal, privacy, internet security, data security. Uh, as you can see up here, Business Essentials for Writers, which is a business fundamentals books for authors and creatives. Um, beyond that, I am founder for Author Essentials, which is an author education and services company. Um, also, one of the founders, along with Gail Martin, our illustrious moderator here for the continual never-ending convention. Um, she, John, uh, John Hartness and I, lost our minds. Um, and beyond that, I do a, different kinds of business and technology consulting. Great. Awesome. Welcome. And uh, Trey. Hey, I'm uh, very happy to be here. I'm uh, Troy Faison, and um, I've published six graphic novels. I try to cover the digital market uh, through uh, Kindle and also paperback through Amazon. And comic books are really kind of the big major thing that I do. So I look forward to a good talk and discussion. Awesome. Dwayne. Hi there. My name is Dwayne Gatesel, and I'm a lawyer in Austin, Texas. I specialize in intellectual property, so copyrights, trademarks, domain names and trial work relating to that. I've been doing this for much longer than I care to admit, let's just say 20 plus years. Awesome. And I'm Gail Z. Martin. I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, steampunk and more under that name. Uh, under the Morgan Bryce name, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. But I also have an MBA in marketing. I spent 25 plus years running corporate marketing departments and doing small business uh, marketing consulting. And I've written four nonfiction books on social media and internet marketing. One of those, the Essential Social Media Handbook, made life hacks list of the top 20 business books to read in 2016. So been knocking around this field for a while as well on both the internet side and the creative side. So let's get right into it and talk about with all of the options out there, why do artists and creatives still need a website or do they? And uh, Jim, why don't you hop in on that first? So the, the best thing about having a website is it's your real estate. Now, having a website is very different than it was 10 years ago, five years ago, even two years ago. I mean, it used to be a matter of if you put up a website and had a blog, you'd find a fair number of people just generically and organically. But it's still the real estate that's yours that you control. And so nowadays, it's much more about being the hub about you and whatever it is you're doing. It's the place that you can post you know, your blog, you can post the books that you're writing, you can post the, the creative things that you're doing. It's also an easy way to link to all the different social media platforms. So the way to look at it as a hub, um, but you absolutely still need it because if nothing else, it's the anchor point by which people can sign up on a mailing list, find out all about who you are, what you're doing and everything else. The one thing I will say about it being your real estate that is not as true as it used to be is that it used to be because it's your real estate you can literally do anything there you want to and nobody can say anything about it that's still largely true but one of the things that you'll now find is for example on facebook if somebody reports your face reports your website they can also block your facebook account as inappropriate content because of it links out to it so there's a lot of things now that are a lot more locked down and tight than they used to be but yeah i'd absolutely say you still have to have one Troy, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very important thing. Mine's actually tied in literally to the Amazon store itself. So if somebody were to see something about me on Facebook or, you know, a different platform, they may go, well, let me Google search Troy Faison, and it'll actually bring right up to the uh, Amazon uh, account. And when you go there, it has a description of who I am, the books that are for sale, and even people can ask questions there. And uh, so it's it's very similar to that format. It's just tied a little bit more into the Amazon store. But I do think it's important 
to be as independent in that area in case that store shuts down. You don't want to just disappear. Mm -hmm. so I think it is important. Dwayne, any perspective to add to that from where you're coming from? Yeah, I mean, I see this a lot with a lot of my clients that, as Jim said, the, the website is kind of the hub. It's the most important launching point for this. And even though you have the proliferation of social media, having the website is still really important and you can gauge its importance by the fact that there's still a lot of people out there who will cyber squat on a particular domain name. So it's very, very important that you secure not only your primary domain name that you want to use in association with it, but also, I, I mean, there's so many top-level domain names that you could bankrupt yourself trying to secure, you know, dot arrow, dot store, dot whatever. Um, I kind of look at it as get the top four or five top-level domain names. Maybe get a hate site like, you know, Dwayne Gatesel sucks or whatever dot com, so that you can prevent someone else because it's such a common thing for someone to use to then talk bad about you online. So I think it's important not only to have your, your primary domain name for your key website, but also some of the other properties to prevent others because frankly, paying me an hour of time to secure it is a whole lot more expensive than just paying the domain name registration fees for a year. So it's true. Well, and you know, something else that I wanted to bring up when Jim said that getting a website now is not like it was five or 10 years ago, one of the other things that has changed in that time is it used to be that you used to, unless you were a programmer, uh, you needed to hire somebody to make all the changes on your website anytime you needed to update something, add something. And with so many websites going to a WordPress base underneath it, where it's really a uh, combination blog slash website, it now you can do most of that updating yourself you probably will want somebody who knows more about things unless you're a graphic designer to do the layout for you set that format up maybe step back in anytime there's a major update to do but on the day-to-day -day, adding a new update on the front of the page adding a new book to a list that's very easy to do yourself or to have um, a virtual assistant do for you. And that's a huge advantage over the way websites used to be where everything was major programming costs. So now your, your blog and your website can be one in the same, or if you're blogging on a separate page, you can have that show up uh, on your, your website automatically, but you can make most of the changes yourself. And that, that's really a huge and flexible thing, uh, both for cost and for being able to frequently update. You can update as often as you want. Yeah, and the only other thing I'd add to that is make sure that you've got your site secure. So uh, that's one of the other things that you do want to spend a little bit of time and invest in. Um, I've gotten a fair number of calls over the years for, my site's been hacked, my site's this, you know, my site's down, it's been turned into a spam bot. So all sorts of things happen. So it's worth a little bit of investment there too. Now, when we talk about internet marketing, we often think of some of the glitzier aspects and something that, that a lot of times shows up like the, the poor relation are email newsletters. And yet they really still occupy a very important role as you're building your platforms and your abilities to reach out to your audience. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the role of uh, email newsletters and why they remain important even though they're not the glitziest tool in the bunch. And um, gonna start back again with you, Jim. Well, to me, it's uh, because email is one of those things that is actually one of the more intimate ways of communicating with people. It's it's something that you can do proactively, but it's one of those things where somebody has signed up on your newsletter list. That means they want to hear from you. That means that they want to know what you've got to say, and then they've got the easy ability to unsubscribe. But again, we're back to it's your real estate. You can write what you want. You can post what you want. You can communicate what you need to. And it's an easy way to keep that personal relationship with readers, fans, and also work with other authors to help build that readership, build that base. 
Um, but it really is, again, communication that you own and control that nobody can really censor. So, for example, like Gail, for where you're writing the male-male paranormal romance, cover reveals can be a big deal on social media because there's things you can't necessarily show. So, you know, it, it's a really good place to control the message you want to send out and, and how you do that. And it's also going to be the people that open your newsletter are the ones that are most committed and most likely to be impacted by what you're sending out the door. Yeah, absolutely. Troy? Yeah, email, it, it's kind of the closest thing that we have to writing a letter because you're kind of like you know, personalizing something, you know. And when they grab their device and before they even try to go to an app or something, they can see just right off the bat, oh, I've got something you know, right here, you know, and, and you click it and, you know, so it definitely gives a personal touch. And I think that it shows people that you care and that you're willing to go that extra mile that maybe some other people won't do. So I think it's a really cool uh, tool and it must be used. Okay. Dwayne. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, I feel like being legal in nature that I'm kind of the wet blanket on a number of different things. And one thing about email marketing, is, particularly newsletters, is with privacy policies getting so much press now, uh, you see this with the GDPR in Europe in particular, that it has cast a much wider net than just in Europe by itself, that you have to be cognizant of kind of the rules changes and that just sending something out, you know, a typical e-blast, for example, in today's marketplace is not really a great thing because regardless of whether it's complying with European regulations or not, uh, you still create all kinds of issues. And so you want to have, whether it's you know, marketing something indicating that it's advertising, whether you give people the opportunity to opt out or to unsubscribe, that kind of thing, it's important not to just think that you can send it to everyone and everywhere without paying attention to some of the legal guidelines as well. Well, and I think two of the most important things regarding that because nobody wants to get into trouble either with the GDPR in Europe or with the Can Spam Act here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, first thing is people have to opt in. You can't buy a list. Well, you can, but you shouldn't. Uh, right. You can't just take the emails of everybody who registered for an event and put them in your email newsletter list if it didn't specifically say, and by registering for this event, you have also signed up, you have also subscribed to receive my monthly newsletter. People have to have the opportunity to opt in and opt out easily. And one of the ways to keep yourself as safe as possible is to use some of the uh, commercial sites out there like MailerLite, Constant Contact, MailChimp, they're designed to be compliant with those laws because if they're not, their whole structure will get taken down. So they will keep an eye on you and give you a way to check and see if your content is too spammy, if it's likely to raise flags on the different internet service providers. They'll let you know if you're getting too many spam reports, too many uh, unsubscribes, that means you're probably not getting people signed up in the right way and it gives you a clue on what to do before you get into real trouble or have your newsletter banned from the site. So that's a key thing and then there always has to be a way for people to unsubscribe. We'd love it if they never did. We want them to love us but the truth is a lot of people will sign up for freebies and even though it says in big bold letters, by the way, you're also going to get my newsletter, they will either forget that they ever saw that, never read it in the first place, or tell you anything you want to hear to get the freebie and then opt out. That's just a part of internet marketing. They need to be able to do it easily. Again, that's where those constant contact, MailerLite, MailChimp, some of the others make it real easy with a very visible button at the bottom so people can opt out. And that keeps you out of trouble, even though you hate to think that somebody doesn't want to hear from you all the time. Now, we've had an unusual year this year because all the in-person events 
book signings, conventions, book tours, everything we're used to doing in order to connect with readers has been canceled if it's in person. Obviously, we're here on Zoom, so that's one of the ways that people are coping using different types of social media and internet marketing to maintain that connection. What are some of the other things you're doing or you're seeing other people doing that helps to bridge this gap for however long we're in this kind of strange current unpleasantness? And I keep going around the same direction, so I'm just not going to stop. Jim? Um, so obviously we have continual convention, which is designed as a, a continual ongoing platform for a place to connect readers and fans and different people in the creative community. We're, we're having a lot of success with that, even though it's only a few months old. Um, I, and I always do a lot of digital media sort of events anyway, um, podcasts. I mean, there's a lot of that that's going on. But we're seeing a lot more people start things that are are creating this digital environment because we all feel that need to stay connected. You know, the fact that really I haven't seen or interacted with friends, family, anybody in person all that much means that we have to rely on these things a lot more. Um, and so the big benefit to it is people are paying attention more to social media for good and for bad. People are paying more attention to things like this, like online Dragon Con, because they've got the bandwidth to do it. It's here, it's easy to come and see. And the other good news about something like this is it's gonna be out there in perpetuity so that we can link to it, we can share this out, help educate you know other creatives, the people we interact with, you know, continue to educate them. And for the people, fans, people that wanna come see, you know, if you're at Dragon, there's you know eight billion people you can't possibly see even a fraction of all the programming going on at any point in time. So this is one of the best ways to be able to share stuff on an ongoing basis. And I think this is going to be here to stay. Sherry, how about you? Uh, you know, what's, it's been very difficult, uh, you know, because you're just so used to a certain way of doing things. And then when this thing hit, uh, it, it was just crazy. I remember when we had our first case in the U.S., and I was telling my wife, I said, you know, this is really, this is going to be a major crazy kind of a thing going on, you know, uh, and to try to be aware of what's going on. Yeah, it does affect things a lot. What I started doing is on Facebook through my fan page, I started doing a lot of live feed and being able to kind of talk on a personal level with people, you know, about, you know, having to be shut down, and uh, how sometimes you could use that as an advantage to have, on one hand, more time to work on your book because you kinda, you're kind of you sort of forced in it. But then also through social media, wow, let me tell you, a lot of people who wouldn't even download certain features and all, boy, they were downloading like crazy because they're stuck in the house. So it's kind of like a, feed, a feeding frenzy uh, for people in social media right now. And I think a lot of people are jumping on board that were not uh, because of being trapped in the house. Uh, but live feed uh, on my fan page has really helped a lot. I saw a lot of changing happen because people are able to tell me, you know, what they're going through and, you know, what I'm working on and maybe what they're working on. Because I think we're a community of, of human beings and, and artists and to try to, you know, feel people's pain, but then also use the the technology where people are kind of forced to use it and uh, to try to, you know, so like I said, I think the live feeds really help a lot with people. Dwayne, anything you'd like people to just remain aware of uh, as they're branching out in some of these new areas? Well, I think it's interesting, and I don't remember if it was Jim or Troy who made the point that this is probably here to stay now. I don't know how we turn back from using video chat and, and you know, Zoom and Microsoft Teams and things like that. And I have to admit, I mean, for me in my practice, I, I tended to meet with clients in person or I would talk with them on the phone. And until all of this started, I'd never even heard of Zoom. And that's probably shameful for me to admit. Uh, but now uh, it's, it's amazing. You know, I have three Zoom conferences a day 
with different clients is not unusual um, because we are such social animals. And, and that's something that I never really thought about t prior to, to this pandemic is just how social we are, how much we truly rely on, you know, seeing people's faces and, you know, gauging the emotional uh, aspect of it and interpreting, and interpreting, you know, what someone says and how they look and that kind of thing. All those visual cues that you don't really get from the phone conference. And it's the thing that I find that I miss so much in the midst of this pandemic. And so everything that can be done on social media, um, like live chat, whatever the case might be, that furthers that human connection is a good thing because it's just been clear to me how desperately we all need it. I, I totally agree. And I think it's been interesting to see how people out of necessity are starting to play with some of these tools, especially Zoom. So uh, as Jim mentioned, we're both very involved in running Continual, which is the online ongoing multi-genre convention that never ends. And that has included uh, Zoom panels like this, live performances by musicians, author readings, author launch parties, trying, and, and you've got this very creative atmosphere where everybody's going, okay, I can't do things the way I'm used to doing them. I need to do something. How can I play with these tools and use them in a different way? And one of the things that fascinates me that we're seeing on Zoom is there are even celebrities who are on lockdown, who aren't on set doing their shows, and they're starting to host Zoom chats with their other celebrity friends from their living rooms. Now, everybody who knows me knows I'm a huge Supernatural fan. Jeffrey Dean Morgan and his wife, if you're not Supernatural, he's Negan on The Walking Dead, sat down and started doing a weekly series of interviews with their friends who, big surprise, also happen to be actors. Nobody would have made that effort if it weren't for the current situation. But now that we've all tried it and liked it and find this whole new level of intimacy, because when you're watching Jeffrey Dean Morgan and his wife sitting on their couch talking to Jensen Ackles and his wife sitting on their couch, and you're kind of the fly on the wall watching this, we don't, I don't think we're going to want to get these things up even when eventually we go back to some sort of in-person connection. So that I think is a huge takeaway for marketing, which is getting over the fear of being on video. Those of us who aren't in the acting community, you know, writers are famously shy, uh, but getting over seeing your face on video, getting over uh, having it out there, learning how to do book, readings. Um, I was invited, Faith Hunter invited me to have tea with her on Zoom. And we put the link out there and any of the fans that wanted to sign up could come join us for tea. And we sat around and talked books and all kinds of stuff. I, I think that brought something new in that we're not going to want to let go of. So it's really exciting to see how people are playing with these things and uh, adapting them and making them work. And as we talked about with Continual, one of the other cool things is this creates a fandom community that has no geographic boundaries. When you put something out there that's a video, not only is it out there in perpetuity, but somebody can watch it in New Zealand, somebody can watch it in Nova Scotia. People aren't limited by when they can get vacation time or whether or not they can afford the hotel or the trip or the tickets. And this makes a lot more of fandom accessible to people in so many other ways. And so I think we're really seeing some terrific creativity blossom here, silver lining to all of the craziness that's going on. Well, and if I can throw one more thing on top of that. Sure. So there's a couple of groups I've been teaching workshops for and um, and one group in particular has done an amazing job because one of the things that we talked about from a social media aspect was how do you reach people in this current current environment? And one of the things I said was video. You know, most people have some visibility issues. They have things about, 
going on video, seeing their face, hearing their name, yeah, or hearing their voice, these sorts of things that that all of us until you spend a fair amount of time doing something like this, and I guess I have the benefit of the last twenty something years doing the consulting and the work I have, I've done a lot of video chats for a very long time. So I'm used to it. I'm comfortable with it. Is taking people who are not comfortable with it, who are now embracing it and having a lot of fun recording videos, doing readings. And this is both on the fiction side of the house as well as nonfiction. I'm working with a couple of people that have consulting practices, have legal practices, um, have educational practices, other things like that that are embracing doing video, Facebook Lives, Instagram Lives, other stuff like this, and are getting over that idea of, you know, because we all kind of joke a little bit about the influencers and the people that are, there, that are out there pushing products. But now we're seeing more people really embrace that as a way of communicating things and having fun with it. And I think that's one of the big kind of takeaways from this has been people learning to have a little bit of fun with new tools and toys. I think one of the other things that plays into it is coming up with other with new ways for us to do things together. So I um, I run a large supernatural fan group on Facebook. We do a Netflix watch party every Monday night where we watch a classic episode together and everybody gets to chat in the chat feed and it's kind of like sitting down on the couch with your besties and watching a show. Netflix makes this very, very easy. Uh, we do another watch on Friday mornings where we watch YouTube videos together. And there are some tools out there that make that very easy to do. So now we're starting to find these apps and, and repurpose some things where Netflix used to be what you did when you came home at night and you ate dinner and you flopped on the couch and you watched Netflix with the people who were physically with you. Now you can create a sense of community by using the Netflix app to watch, to do a watch party and interact with people in, in real time. So we're also starting to get really creative and look at these things. Jim knows I've been looking at ways to bring in um, opportunities to do YouTube karaoke and sing-alongs because that's a fun thing. We miss that at conventions. It's silly, but it's fun. Yeah. And we've done movie nights on Continual. Again, Netflix watch party where we watch a wonderfully trashy movie and <laughs> do our own MST3K. But it brings us together. And I think that's one of the really exciting opportunities, despite the crazy stuff going on outside, uh, with looking at how can we repurpose some of these things beyond how we've always thought of using them. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk internet marketing, in addition to the websites and the blogs and the video that we've mentioned so far, the big elephant in the room is social media. What, how are people making good use of social media for internet marketing? And what do you see coming up or, or how do you see this shifting and changing? Jim? So what we saw for the first couple of weeks of the current unpleasantness was everybody was spending a lot more time on social media. I mean, everybody was, in, was buried in it because it gave us a way to continue to connect. And now that we've all been kind of trapped in, in at home for what feels like at least three years, um, you know, we see the people that are being positive and giving messages that are hopeful or fun or things that kind of lighten things up are effective. People share it. People like it. And the more that you as somebody sitting there consuming social media click and say, I like this, I want this, the more positive your feed gets. Then if you're sitting there and everything you're watching and posting is the world is on fire and everything's going to hell, that's what you're going to get and see more of. And so when you start doing marketing algorithms, when you start trying to sell books, when you try to start trying to sell product and whatnot, this also influences what is going to be marketed to you. And so one of the things you have to be aware of as an author and a creator is who is your market? How do you reach them? If you're selling romance novels that are, you know, fun, uplifting, or even, you know, we're going to go 
go Monster Hunter of the Week and then have a good shag, you know, whatever the case may be, if that's what you're doing, you also need to know the message you're posting on as a part of your social media better attract those readers and keep keep that message going. If you're writing apocalyptic fiction, well, that's a little easier these days, but people aren't really buying because it's kind of hard to beat the current reality. But I think that's what people are getting a much bigger education in is knowing how what you post, how what you share, how what you do on social media influences who's going to see your material and how they're going to necessarily want to buy it. And so the other thing we're seeing a lot more of is people being much more cognizant about who they're buying product from. And so if somebody's like, oh, who's this author? They go look at the social media feed. It's It becomes very, very definitively important to make sure what you're posting out there. And if you're posting, if you're if you decide that it's more critical to post political or social messages right now, it's worth it to, to be aware what's more important. Is it that persona you're putting out there for social media to run your business as an author or creative? Or is it more important to manage the message you're trying to get out there? And that's a personal decision that every one of us has to make. But be aware and cognizant that it has an influence on more than just the people that follow you. Absolutely. Troy? Yeah, um, you know, what I try to do is I will go through social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or what have you, and I'll try to find someone who, you know, maybe they're just starting to draw for the first time. Maybe they're starting to write some short stories for the first time, and you can kind of see they're struggling with it. Maybe they're not getting a lot of attention. I'll actually go on there and introduce who I am, tell them what I do, and, and try to give them some uh, confidence and encouragement about what they're working on. And then what they'll do is they'll respond back, and then you can kind of start building relationships with people that maybe mm -hmm. most people will not, because they'll say, well, you're not doing anything successful enough and all that type of stuff. I like going to people that are trying to get there, you know, and to be able to uh, share with them what I do and what they can do to get there, you know, how to be creative. And then I've noticed people starting to open up, people starting to be as interested in what I'm doing as what I'm interested in what they're doing. The only catch is um, your stuff is copyrighted and you'll want to get in a situation where you tell someone, hey, tell me your story. Uh, that's probably not a very good idea because if you inadvertently use some of that, they know that you stole it from them. So there's a thin line between, you know, trying to talk with people in marketing and sharing and not get in a situation where you're going to be getting compromised with other people's ideas. So what I try to do is just focus more on encouraging people and how I stay encouraged. And I think, you know, it's just start to become more hands-on with people and helping people to get to the next step. But be cautious at the same time. Uh, so that's kind of what, I, what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do anyway. And Dwayne? Well, Troy raises an interesting point there, um, something that I wanted to mention earlier, because, you know, in the digital age, I see this all the time, that it just, it's human nature that it, it's easier to copy something than it is to kind of create something on your own. And in social media, I see this all the time. I mean, what's posted tends to live forever. And if you are posting something that's positive and the idea is to you know, attract others to you, to your work product, that's sort of great. Whereas if you, if you just go extremely negative and have bad things to say, it's going to reflect poorly upon you and on your work product and so forth. So it, you know, not to say that you shouldn't feel free to express your opinion, but keeping things lighter, more positive is going to have a better effect on what the end goal is. Um, but then you also have to be careful in you know, not copying someone else's work, not assuming that someone else's photo or someone else's, you know, song lyrics or whatever the case might be, that, because it's just so easy, you know, to click copy and paste and you put it in your own uh, social media feed. It, it's just, it's unbelievable the amount of problems that can result, whether it's you know, use of someone else's photo or lyrics or whatever the case might be. You have to resist that temptation and not assume 
oh, I'm, I'm not using it for commercial purposes, or I'm only using a snippet of this or whatever. Uh, because again, that, that's the, the legal problems are just immense from that. Well, and one of the other things that kind of ties back into what Jim said about um, forging connections is, and it's a very simple thing, is to reach out to other authors and creatives, your friends, the people you've been on panels with, the people you hang with, and boost each other's work. So when one of your friends has a book coming out, repost the, the link and steer people to their books come up with opportunities that you can offer to other people to help share their work and their visibility. And that brings more people to you because you're the person sharing. So, and, and it can be very, it can be very simple as in setting up Zoom conversations with your fellow creatives that you then share out on the internet. I do different variations of author Q&A in all three of my major groups, uh, which gives me something that I can invite my friends to. They do similar things that they invite me to. For half an hour of my time and a little bit of Q&A, we've gained exposure to each other's readers, and we've done a good thing in the world. We've, we've lifted the visibility of books that those readers may really enjoy reading or help them discover a new author. That's one of the most powerful things, I think, with internet marketing on social media is this, not only the connectivity, but the ability to raise others with you and create that rising tide that lifts all boats, even if at the moment we can't get to a convention, we can't get to a bookstore, we can't get to a book signing. With just a little bit of cleverness and some friends, we can create a pretty darn good substitute and put something out into the world that attracts new people to everybody involved. Now, what do you think about some of the major platforms out there? Of course, we've covered YouTube with all the video, but Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, if you had to advise authors and creators to pick two, what would you tell them and why? Jim? Um, if you're going to pick two, uh, normally you're going to probably go ahead and start with Facebook um, because some part of your market is going to be on Facebook, some way, shape, or form. If you're writing romance, a lot of that market is going to be out there. If you're writing business books, that market's going to be out there. If you're writing YA, the parents, the grandparents that are going to be buying it are out there. Then the second part of it is looking at who is your major market? Where are they? Are you know? It's understanding: Are they on Instagram? Are they on Twitter? Are they on you know? Where are they? Where are they going? Um, I mean, even LinkedIn. LinkedIn is growing at, for even fiction. LinkedIn is becoming a bigger social network um, where it's not no longer just about the business. You see people forging personal relationships, much like we saw people doing on Facebook. 10 years ago and so people are becoming more comfortable in using it from a more social aspect but I'd say the most important thing on picking the platform is which one are you going to enjoy and get the most benefit out of yourself because at the end of the day you're on that platform to share who you are and what you're doing it's it's less these days about marketing and pushing out there as it is telling people here's who I am and if you're on a platform you hate then it's gonna show I mean and if you hate all the platforms it's gonna show um, but that to me is it is is discover the platforms where you like and where you're comfortable and then work from there okay try so yeah Instagram uh, and Facebook um, you know, Instagram, if you post, let's say, a video, it only gives you a certain amount of time, and it'll cut that video. And then if you do a live feed, it'll only stay in there, stay on there for so long, and then it'll delete out. Uh, but a lot of, there's a lot of traffic on there, and there's a lot of people to engage. With Facebook, though, you can do a live feed as long as you want, and it'll stay on there. 
And I think Facebook has an older age bracket. I think uh, Instagram's a little bit younger, perhaps. Um, they're similar, but there are differences. Uh, but those are pretty much the two big ones. But nothing stays on top, and nothing lasts forever. So we always have to research, you know, which platform's doing better than what, and which one has what to offer. But I would definitely uh, say those two are very beneficial. And then when you do post on either, always remember to post to groups and uh, to find a group that likes your type of material. And uh, a clever way is a lot of groups don't want you to advertise. So what I do is I'll post a couple of visuals from my artwork. And at the very end, I'll pop in my logo, Troy Face and Novels. Won't say, you know, much about it. That way I'm not really advertising because there's a lot of artwork. But then people will go, Troy Face and Novels. You didn't say nothing about that. Let me Google search that. And then it'll pop right up and boom, they're in the store. So you can be kind of cautious about it and creative about it, but definitely Facebook and Instagram, I believe, are probably the two big ones. Okay, Dwayne? Well, last year at DragonCon, I presented a topic regarding the dangers of social media to our democracy. So I'm gonna leave that aside in order to answer your question. Um, I'd say probably Facebook, just because it is the largest and has the most utility. And then from there, I think it really depends on what medium you're working in. So, you know, for a lot of the people I know working in visual arts, uh, uh, Instagram is the best, you know, for photographers and so forth, whereas Twitter is better if you're working from the written word because it kind of forces you to be pithy in, you know, such a short, abbreviated fashion. So, to me, it depends on the medium as to which one you'd want to go to. And one of the things I'd add to that is you don't have to just talk about your work. You can also talk about your passions. That might be knitting, that, that might be dog training, that might be hiking. But when you talk about something you're sincerely passionate about, that brings people to you who share that passion. And they may turn out to share more than just that interest. They may also like the kind of book you write or the kind of art you draw. You might find that you have a lot of commonalities. So. And, and we like to see somebody who's passionate about something that, that helps boost everybody's mood, whether we, even if we don't do the same craft or, or art. So don't just be focused on pushing whatever it is you create. Talk about something you absolutely love and see who it brings to you. And, and you may find that that brings you a wonderful new group of fans as well. Now we're coming down to the very end here. So as we prepare to wrap up, let's tell everybody where they can find you on the internet and on social media. Jim? Um, well, you can find me at jamespianettles.com, authoressentials.net, uh, authoressentialsworkshops.com, um, continualconvention.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, uh, James P. Nettles III. Um, I'm out there and I'm relatively active. I show up some on Instagram. Um, uh, Author Essentials also has a Facebook group, Facebook page, and an Instagram account. Um, show up some with Continual on YouTube, the different platforms we've got going there. Um, I occasionally show up on one of my Twitter accounts, make a little bit of noise and go away. And um, that's, I, I'd like to say that's about it, but I feel sure I'm missing about 20 different things. Troy? Well, you definitely can find me on uh, Facebook, on my fan page. It's Troy Face and Novels. And also on Instagram, the same title. And uh, you can Google search the same thing, and it can bring up even more uh, projects that I'm working on with Amazon and with uh, Kindle. And uh, I try to keep it to where everything I do ties into one brand name, Troy Face and Novels. So if a person will Google search that, it can pop up different platforms, so. Okay, Dwayne? Well, having a really weird, bizarre name, uh, there's no other Dwayne Gatesels in the entire world from what I can tell. Uh, so it's really, really easy to find me. Uh, on my law firm website is uh, intprop, I-N-T-P-R-O-P, short for intellectual property, uh, dot com. I am on Facebook. Uh, 
like Jim, I, I opened Twitter and, and Instagram, and it was kind of like the Christmas gift that you play with for two weeks, and then you put it away in the back of the closet forever, and that's what those two have been for me. Okay. Uh, I'm Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce. The Z is very important because there are other Gail Martins, but I'm the Gail Z. Martin author. So that's gailzmartin.com, at Gail Z. Martin on Twitter, GZ Martin on Pinterest and a couple other places. My um, MorganBryce.com, B-R-I-C-E, is for the romance side of things. Morgan Bryce author on uh, Instagram, Morgan Bryce book on Twitter. And my reader groups are Shadow Alliance for the epic and urban fantasy, Worlds of Morgan Bryce for the uh, romance, Supernatural TFWNC, if you happen to be a fan of the show. And then, of course, Continual, which also has a major presence as a Facebook group. And if you type in Continual, capitalize the T, you'll find us there. So lots of good stuff going on. And, of course, you can find our Zoom panels on YouTube. Thank you guys so much for being with us today and sharing all this wonderful stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gail.